Next, from Springfield, we first talked to advocates of equal rights for both parents in child custody cases and then talked to Representative LaShawn Ford, who is advocating for a bill that would do just that. This runs about 15 minutes. Gentlemen, thanks for joining us. Uh, you're here at the Capitol fighting on, on behalf of a bill uh, that is probably one of the most emotional experiences that any parent can go through, and it's to, as I understand it, uh, have a, a fair hearing for both parties as you go into uh, arguing about custody. Uh, Mick, let me start with you, if I might, as you've been advocating for this. Tell us what the bill is and what it would do. Well, generally, right now, when you go into court, uh, there's sort of a winner and a loser. What this bill does is says before you even step in the courtroom, before anything is applied one way or other, you're going to be treated as equally. And then from there, there's a presumption that if you're a fit parent, you're treated equally. And then from there, if they want to go to a different arrangement, that they have to start bringing in evidence. So it's pretty much a fairness equality bill. And so if people would say, well, what if one of these parents is on drugs or some other way uh, deficient? What, what's the answer? Oh, actually, nothing changes as far as the best interest factors. All 17 best interest factors are still there that the judge, this is just a presumption. From there, the judge can change you know, how much parenting time or restrict, restrict parenting time based on evidence and these 17 factors of best interest. We don't replace the best interest factors. They remain there always. So for those people who are worried that this mandates both parties get equal time, that's not necessarily true, if there's evidence to the contrary. Correct. That's absolutely incorrect. Uh, there's lots of misinformation out there that's saying it's tying the judge's hands, but does nothing at all. It just does this presumption that both parents, if they're fit, they have equality. And then again, the judge, like any other day, as the court you know, the statute presently is, he goes through his best interest factors plus whatever else he deems you know, necessary to include for making his decision. And then l let me just say, am I right to say, uh, I, I talked to one attorney and he said Illinois already has a co equating law in the books, but uh, he admitted privately that it's probably not actually put into practice that way, that it's still... Uh, the presumption, presumption is often on um, one, one part, typically that if it's smaller children that the mother is going to get uh, assigned more time with the children. Is, it, is that your experience? Uh, th that's definitely my experience. Right now it says maximum time with both parents, but the way it's applied is you know, one parent obviously gets a lot more time than the other. And this would just, you know, by saying they're equal when they go in the courtroom, this would pretty much highlight to the judge that, hey, this is the starting point, not a point that we hope to get. This is where we're going to start, and we're going to you know, go change based on the factors. And, Richard, you're, um, you were a member of the Armed Forces at one point, I believe, and yes. you're, you're a professional nurse still, I think? Or yes, is that right? yes, I'm a nurse. Uh, so what is your experience? Why are you so passionate as far as coming all the way down to Springfield to lobby on behalf of this? Well, it's not only my uh, personal nightmare experience with Illinois Family Law Court, but in the larger sense, uh, I do not want future generations to go through the same uh, inequality up front. Uh, you know going into Family Law Court that it's going to be extremely contentious by design. Uh, it's going to be uh, extremely unfair. Uh, it is going to be extremely gender biased. Uh, and that does not, uh, that adversarial environment is the last environment. It's a counter therapeutic environment. Uh, it's the last environment you would put a troubled family into. It only takes a bad situation and makes it worse. And in my personal case, a nightmare. I was going to say, and that's a great point that Richard pointed out is the lots, it's an adversarial nature, but right now parents going in feel that it's unfair. If we have this equality, then the parents at least go in feeling that, hey, I have a fair shot or I'm being treated fairly. Right now they're going in knowing that they're not going to be treated fairly, so I'm not sure why there's such a contention on using the words of, hey, let's treat them equally to start with. Now, let's just talk about some practicality. If, if people live a couple of blocks away, it would be easy to have 50-50 uh, sharing, and that might even be uh, work out because someone might have to go out of town on business or something. Well, what if one parent moves from a Chicago to a Springfield or a Springfield to Chicago? I mean, you, how do you work that out, or what happens in that circumstance? Well, it's still one of the 17 uh, best interest factors has to do with distance. 
and that's still in the bill. That has not left the bill. It hasn't been taken out. So it's still there for the judge to consider that when he's you know, deciding how much time for each parent. We don't, we don't have a member of the Illinois Bar uh, Association with us to ask them, but they're arguing, I believe, against this bill. What arguments are they making, and, and what is your response to their arguments? Well, uh, uh, I want to say that's a hard one. I know, I know it's, it's, <laughs> it's unfair on one hand to ask you to make their argument, but, but they're raising objections. Do you have, a, do you have a, an objection to their objections? Oh, oh, sure, yes. I do. Or, well, one, of their, one of their big ones is they say this will create more litigation. I'm not sure how. If you're going into court, both parties are going in court knowing they're going to be treated equally. I think there's less chance of litigation than knowing that one side's going to win big and the other side's going to lose big. So there's, to me, there's going to be more litigation that way because somebody wants to be, I won't say the winner, but somebody wants to be the winner. And Richard, you, uh, you, you know, the opposition to parental equality is uh, fond of saying that uh, judges already have uh, the ability in the current statutes to pursue, pursue parental equality. Well, that's not the reality. And, you know, if we look through history, uh, we got the... 15th Amendment in the year 1870 that gave African American males the right to vote. But we all know in, in 2018, looking back, that it took a hundred years of constant re-legislation, more and more bills uh, to manifest e uh, voting rights equality into reality. It took to, uh, the Voting Rights Act of 1965 uh, before it really started to actually happen. Uh, that you, you that you could feel confident that you could go vote uh, without obstacles and speed bumps uh, put in your way. Uh, and so most of the cases now that the, the Illinois State Bar Association claims that are settled out of court before they ever go to a, a judge, that is due to exhaustion. It's not through an examination of the merits of what would be in the best interest of children. It is through spiritual, psychological, emotional, and most importantly, financial exhaustion. Um, that, that's the current business model of the Illinois State Bar Association. And that's a, that was a very interesting point. So it, it is, as we've seen before, you might have a book on the, uh, or law, I should say, on the books, but is it being applied accordingly? And I think, Mick, you would say that, uh, that it's not, as you have said, but... Am I correct to say that you you might argue that it's it's almost as if the court is still looking at couples as if they're coming through a Nazi and Harriet kind of thing where mom is still staying at home and, and they're getting the benefit of the doubt instead of, which I think you're arguing, that both parties would walk in and be presumed to be good parents uh, and, and have equal parenting. So we're talking about, what, the same number of days a week? I mean, we got seven days so it's not a 50 50 how do we make this work out what does it mean in actually application to have uh, equal time well, there's lots of different models out there everything from one week on one week off uh, there's a two three three two model but there's lots of different ones and the thing that's kind of interesting about it is one of the biggest complaints from the or one of his ar yeah. biggest arguments is there's too much shifting back and forth of a child between the two different parents and the strange part is the models, week on, week off, there's a lot less shifting between the parents where the parents don't have to see each other if there is animosity exchange one day a week at the school. So, it, so it's kind of strange. These models are, you know, do away with those arguments. Yeah, the, the state, uh, I thought I had it with me. I think I do. But the state of Ohio currently has a standard parenting plan that is ordered for every stage of childhood development. And it's based upon 50-50, or as close as humanly possible. So I don't know why we cannot adopt that uh, model, as well as the 25 plus states that are uh, attempting, aggressively attempting to adopt language similar to House Bill 4113 right now. This is a nationwide movement. Equality is going to happen. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. And as we said, just to reinforce, if, if there's evidence to the contrary of the uh, one party or the other not being a fit parent, that would be taken into consideration, and then it wouldn't be a 50-50 arrangement. No, that, that's absolutely correct. Like I said, none of the best interest factors have been removed at all. They're still there, and it's still fully the judge's discretion. 
And, and House Bill 4113 does not change any of the, the current domestic violence protections. Uh, we're, we all abhor domestic violence. Justice needs to be swift on domestic violence, especially those of us who are uh, seeking parental equality uh, really abhor domestic violence because isolated incidences are used as to, to bludgeon the rest of us. As we stand here, uh, you were in committee earlier today. The committee took a break. It's going to be coming back very shortly, so we should let you go. But were there any uh, questionings or uh, as far as the reactions from lawmakers earlier in the day, did you think the message was getting through or were there still a lot of lingering misunderstandings? I know I'm asking you know, to make a presumption. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I, you know, God only knows the entirety of their motivations. But it certainly isn't uh, the words that are coming out of their mouths. That you, if you look at these representatives' websites, every other sentence is about equality. Big push nationwide for equality for different demographics, different groups. Somehow, in 2018, we can't get parental a, a rebuttable presumption up front as a starting point of 50/50 shared parenting. This is bizarre, uh, and it, there's a disconnect. Uh, and a disingenuousness uh, on the part of the Illinois State Bar Association as well as other groups that uh, oppose 4113. So Mick, just uh, in closing, if we already have a law, as people argue on the books, that says on paper it's supposed to be uh, considered equal, how legislatively does this change what's already on the books? How, how does it make it even more fair than what it's supposed to currently be? I think pretty much it reinforces the you know, both parents are important, both parents are fit. Whereas right now, although it, both parents may be fit, it's not reinforced. And this would say, hey, this, you know, this is our starting point where they're equal. And I think that just reinforces what we claim the present statute does. And, and one other thing I'd like to add there, uh, there's, there was a lot of talk about research. It, we, for years, we've given the opposition to shared parenting all kinds of gestures. We want the research that shows that we shouldn't have shared parenting, like they, they try to oppose 4113. And so I've researched this all the way up to the Supreme Court. There are no outcomes data to prove that Illinois family law courts are getting it right for Illinois children. There's no data. They cannot take their index finger and point to how they are being successful or not. Right, gentlemen, thank you for joining us and explaining it, and good luck to you. Right, thanks, sir. Representative LaShawn Ford, thanks for joining us. Uh, we just uh, had to vote in the committee and you, the bill that you were supporting for, what would we call it, equal rights for both parents in child custody cases? Uh, what, what are your thoughts right now that it got out of committee? You know, my thoughts are that we had a group of men and women that worked hard to draft legislation that was about fairness and equality for parents, and now we have an opportunity now to continue the discussion seriously to make sure that we pass a bill in Illinois that's all about equality for parents. And what do you say to those people who say, um, we already have a law in the book that gives a presumption of equal treatment of both parents? You know, I say that people that are honest about their reasons for being opposed to the bill, I ask them to sit down and learn about the bill so that we can um, make sure that they understand what we're really trying to do. And for people that are opposed to the bill because they have a job to do, ask them to step aside and don't and stand in the way of justice, or at least be honest about the fact that they are opposed because it's their job to be opposed. But what we have here is a bill 4113, where we have people, grassroots people, fathers, mothers, grandmothers, parents, all over saying, that there should be equality when we're dealing with child custody. And so when you talk to lawyers, you have to ask the lawyers that's opposed to it, how could they ever do what's in the best interest of the child when by law they're obligated to do what's in the best interest of their client? Uh, I think everyone would understand when you're dealing with child custody issues, it's one of the most gut-wrenching and emotional experiences that I, anyone could go through. Why did you want to champion this bill? I wanted to champion because I'm all about equality. 
And when you hear men and women and parents all over the state talking about that there is an injustice in um, the uh, parenting law, and when you examine the current law, then you could do nothing but be a supporter. And, you know, I'm blessed to have the opportunity to be a legislator in Springfield where I could work on things like social justice. And this is a social justice issue, and we cannot let up. It's uh, a lot of times we know the politics of a certain bill. This is unusual because uh, I didn't know how either of the parties are voting or members would be voting. Now that it's out of committee, do you have any inclination of how it might fare on the floor? You know, I think that what we have to do is convince people. And um, now we have an opportunity to continue to work. I mean, not, justice doesn't come easy, and we don't expect to get to 60 votes easily but we do plan to work to make sure that we can get to the 60. Had the bill died in committee, then the discussion would have died, and we don't need the discussion to die. And now, hopefully, the, um, the lawyers, the, um, the Bar Association, Cook County Bar, State's Bar Association, the domestic violence people will come to the table knowing that we're not going to let up, that this bill should pass, and we're open for negotiations to make sure that we have the best law on the books for children and families. Right. Thanks for joining. Thank you, Terry.